Hey everybody, how's it going? Today I'd like to announce the series finale of Rossman Realty. So this started as an accident. It's kind of a joke. I saw that we were viewing the space that was on Avenue C and 12th Street, and it seemed like there were some silly things happening. There was a light fixture hidden behind a wall, lots of really funny stuff. And Paul was there, and he was, you know, he was being Paul and grilling, what's that doing there? Why is this here? Why is this there? Why is that there? And asking his questions in his typical kind of Dilbert meets uh, Marine Corps way of thinking and presenting himself, which I find to be humorous, but also awesome. I want somebody like that on my side if I'm looking for a space. And I streamed it, and a lot of people took great interest in it. So I decided, let me just keep doing this for the hell of it. And it was very interesting that there's about five times to ten times the viewership for me looking for a space to do my job than me actually doing my job. So the work that I do, the fixing of boards, the, all the information, how to you know, try to start a profitable business for yourself doing this, Nobody gives a shit. But this finding the space that I will do that in was very interesting to people. So I started recording this stuff regularly. And recently, I said I was not going to take the 30th Street space for several reasons. The first was it started, you know, started with the demolition clause. We got it up to 200K, but still, that, that seems like it's going to be below construction cost at this point anyway. And that's amortized 20000 a year. So if they kick me out in year five or so, I'm, you know, I'm only getting 100K. Then there was the fact that the lease was about 64 pages. It had a lot of silly stuff in it. You know, it was an office lease, not a retail one, which showed me that they probably weren't sending their best with regards to having an attorney to write up the lease or even copy and paste the relevant one. That was kind of lame. I saw that the space needed a lot of construction. That was kind of lame. I saw that the, I saw what was inside the electrical panel that, I mean, I, I showed the pictures of it. Need, need I say more? And then there was the, the super acting like a bit of an ass. Any of these by themselves would not have been the uh, final blow. All of them together just painted a picture for me of, I don't want to give you $1.7 million over the next 10 years of my life. Bye. So I decided to leave. And I did a video where I, I uh, was talking about the message of the Super Red sends, the entire negotiating process, including that whole, oh, yeah, the deposit is not going to be the first three months, it's the last three months, kind of all this kind of silliness that was uh, said to be standard that I have not experienced not interested in it, you know, just kind of you're acting like cunts. Bye. And they asked if I would come back to the table, consider the space, what were your concerns, and they tried to correct each one individually. And like, well, this demolition clause, but you're okay with it, and they're probably not going to use it. Oh, yeah, we asked for the last three months because that's standard, not the first three months, but you got it. Oh, uh, you know, there's a lot of construction, but you come back to us if you think that maybe we could do more on the concession, but you only get one try at that. And, yeah, the super is this way, but, well, this, you know, you're going to be dealing with the construction management people, project management management in the building, not him. Every little point, you know, they could kind of try to address. And uh, the, the great thing about YouTube comments, my favorite part about YouTube comments is that people can kind of remind you when you're not following your own advice. So five years ago, I did a video on manipulation and somebody reminded me of the comments in that video that I did. I will put them here so that you can read. And I'll also put some of the excerpts as well. What I want to get across to you is that manipulation is not something that happens in one foul swoop. Manipulation is something that happens in these little bits and pieces. And as much as I hate acting on gut feelings and emotions because they're not often logical, sometimes logic is the very thing that will get you in trouble with manipulation. Why do you think these really, really smart people are doing a lot of these fucked up things? Why do you think really smart people are easy to talk into joining a cult than people who are, who are, who are screwed in the head? The reason is because because the people who are dumb, they, under, they, they work on their feelings. They say, you know what, I, I, you know, when I was two years old, I learned that this is how I'm supposed to think. And that's the moral I grew up with. Screw you for telling me otherwise. Whereas the logical person, the forward-thinking person is going to think, if there's a good reason for something, I would agree with it. So they, they, that's, that's where logic works against you. And at some point, there's going to be something inside of you that says, you know what? I don't want to deal with this anymore. And there's going to be a line. And you know where your line is for you. You're going to feel it in your heart and in your brain. It's going to be a little tingling feeling that kind of goes down the bottom of your spine that says, I have reached the limit of what it is I wish to deal with. And for me... With that woman, it was realizing that she had actually read through 57 pages of my email. And not only did she read through the 57 pages, but she was kind of telling me why you shouldn't be bringing it up. You shouldn't be mad that I did that. You should expect that I did that. And you should be okay with it. It's like, no. You know, other people may be willing to put up with that. That's great. 
that's not what I want to let into my life. What you have to realize is that there's always going to be some reason as to why right now is the wrong time to flip the switch. Why, like, why are you doing it now, but you didn't before? Because here's the thing, since it's not like you're going from here to here, but since you're going from here to here to here to here to here, since each one of those blocks are evenly sized, it's going to be like this. So if you were okay with this, and then you were okay with this, and then you were okay with this, well, why are you not okay with this? Because each one of those little pieces of manipulation is the exact same amount of manipulation. It's always the same amount of manipulation, the same amount of reasoning, the same amount of time. It's always the exact same little block. Again, you're not going from being a nice person to being a terrorist in one step. It's just, well, you were okay with this, right? Then you were okay with this, right? Then you were okay with this, right? Then you were okay with this, right? So why are you not okay with this? Why are you being a dick? Why are you being an asshole? Why are you being insensitive? Why are you being so mean when you were okay with those other things? And that's why it has to be like flipping a switch. That's why it has to be like something you simply decide, you know what? I've had enough and where you don't care. Because when are you going to say it's enough is enough? When are you going to say that I'm done and sick and tired of this? Because if you were okay with this and this and this, if somebody can use that argument with you, if somebody could say, well, you were okay with that, and then you were okay with that, and then you were okay with that, then you're going to be stuck being okay with these little blocks um, for the rest of your life. And that means that that person has the power to direct you to believe and to think exactly what they want you to think just because you're afraid of what people think of you. That's the power of flipping the switch. That's the power of saying, you know what? I'm done. I've had enough. Goodbye. I'm done. Blah, 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 blah. And walking away. Being okay with simply flipping a switch and saying, I'm done with this. Being okay simply going, zoink, I don't want to deal with this anymore, is what's going to empower you to leave a manipulative situation. And one of the things about manipulation or manipulative people or people that just kind of draw you in in the sales process, let's say this is good, this is middle, this is bad. Let's say you're in the middle. And, you know, something happened, you know, eh, demolition clause. Oh, yeah, we're just going to claim something standard last three months rather than first three months when it's not. Eh, we're going to send you a retail uh, office lease rather than a retail one. It's going to include a bunch of bullshit in it that you're going to have to pay your lawyer by the hour to go, to go through and fix because we copied and pasted the wrong lease. Eh, the super is acting like kind of an asshole eh, before you've actually signed the lease. And, yeah, you've gotten from here to here. Now, each one of those things is not that bad. You got from intermediate to bad, but each one is only a little bit of bad. The thing is, well, if you were okay going this far, and then this far, and this far, and this far, then when are you going to stop? At some point, you just have to say, as I said in my old video, you're tired of it and move on. And I did. But then I forgot my own advice. And when I got the phone call, I decided, fine, I'll give him one more shot. When in reality, if I was in a level-headed state of mind, I wouldn't have done that. I would have forgotten about the space. I would have moved on. I wouldn't have scheduled contractors to show up and all of that because all that wound up being a waste of time. They're not willing to go for more than four months uh, of free rent. And four months of free rent is, is absolutely fundamentally unacceptable when you have a 3% escalation on $12,833 per month with a certain amount of the building property tax increase added on top of that. I, I, I don't want to spend two, over $200,000 fixing up this building for a place that could easily kick me out in five years. And if they did... You're only getting 100k of your money back. Just no, just not not working for me. And uh, luckily, that decision was made for me. So before I could figure out, before I could hear that they would they were rejecting these six months of free rent, I was able to find out that the owner of the video saw my videos, or I was calling saying, hey. The Building management's kind of acting like cunts. And they were not very happy with that, which honestly makes my decision a lot easier. That concludes season one of Rossman Realty. And at the end of it, this may be the series finale of it. I am... Um I don't know how much of this I'm going to be recording into the future because at this point, I'm honestly starting to get tired of looking. Seems like, as I said in my previous video, there is about to be some sort of real estate bubble pop. I do think that the real estate bubble is the least of the economic issues. And when that downturn comes, I would like to sweep up property that was um, going to be go at a, uh, going slightly cheaper than it is now. But also, this entire experience has just kind of tired me out to the dealing with the ins and outs of, of the real estate process, whether I'm being shown spaces that are 800 square feet when they claim it's 1,800, whether my broker is lying to the, not Alan, of course, whether they're lying to the uh, building uh, management and leasing office about how many customers I get a day just to try to get their commission, who cares if Lewis gets a lease that he winds up getting kicked out of the building on, or any of this kind of bullshit where I just say, hey, man, I'd happily pay you to let me into the building. Will you, are you okay with it? No. Is it emergency? It is not emergency? No, exactly. Exactly. Like, uh, fuck, I don't want to, I just, I, I'm grown tired of dealing with this shit. And it, what it's done is it's caused me to focus a lot less on my 
primary business, which is the primary way that I make revenue. YouTube is great as a side gig, but fixing boards, managing my company, ma you know, finding new clients, all of this is what actually brings in revenue. And honestly, this is just kind of starting to give me a sour taste in my mouth for the entire process. I had a talk with Alan today about it, and you know, I, I strongly encourage that he deposit my $2,000 check I gave him the other day. I've had a lot of type A clients that are very picky and a pain in the ass, and it's worth it for me when they realize, hey, I'm a pain in the ass. I'm going to pay you a pain in the ass amount of money to work with me. It's not worth it otherwise, and I want Alan to understand that even if he doesn't get his commission, there's going to be something you get just for the effort you put in. This is not going to be no fix, no fee. There, you know, I, I expect you to make money for your time, and I want you to understand that I'm in this for the long haul. But also, I had a talk with him, and I, I used to think, I used to live in this world where I thought that the broker got one month, the first month commission, and that was it. So if it was a $2,000 space, you get 2000 If it was 10000 the broker gets 10000 The broker gets considerably more than that, uh, an amount that, actually, that genuinely surprised me. And he was very upfront and honest about this with me, where he said that the more institutional landlords will typically pay the broker fee, whereas the smaller landlords will either not pay the fee or they'll say they'll pay the fee and then they won't. And then the tenant will sign the lease and the broker will get fucked. And that is something that obviously brokers are looking to avoid. And I, you know, I thought about it. The landlord of this building he, he, you know, he was decent enough to me before he sold the, the buildings to Hub. He was decent enough, but I knew him for several years. If a broker came along and said, I even want a $3 fee, he would have said, you get out of here, no broker, because he doesn't want to deal with a middleman. And this building, I started renting this space seven years ago. Imagine, yeah, seven years ago. No, eight years ago. Wow. Eight years ago, I started renting the space. It was totally dilapidated, but I got it for $3,500. That's a steal. There are, there, are, there are apartments in this neighborhood that are smaller than the store that cost more money than that. It's, it, was a great, it was a great deal. But that's a deal that I wouldn't have gotten going through a broker because the broker would never have wanted to deal with this. So I reached an arrangement with Alan where we came up with, I will pay a fee. If a small landlord does not want to pay your fee, I will pay a fee if you find me a space that is amazing to my standards, to my specs, that I think, wow, I think is great, and I'm willing to take it. But I can't pay you the fee that you would usually get because, wow, that is a lot of money, and I like you. I think you're an honest broker. I think you're a great broker. I think you're the best broker I've ever met, and honestly, you have changed my confidence in the fact that people from New York are capable of being good, honest, upfront people for a change. But I value you to maybe like first month's rent, maybe first month's rent plus a few thousand. I'm not trying to lowball you. I'm not, I'm not asking you to work for less money because I hate when people do that to me. This is what I value that service at. This rate, I can't do that. So, uh, well, and he seemed fairly receptive to that, which was, again, you know, surprising to me. I wasn't asking him to be receptive to working for a lower rate, but he was open to that and the idea of showing me other buildings because I understand that the deals like this place that I got may be off the radar if I'm dealing with a broker that would prefer to deal with institutional uh, landlords because the institutional landlords are the only ones that are not fucking the broker at every turn. And I understand why it is that the smaller landlords are looking to fuck the broker at every turn. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's moral. I'm not saying it's ethical. I'm just saying that if you're getting a tenant for a 10-year lease and the broker is going to want a twenty to forty to thousand dollar cut of that in my price range, I can see why at that point the landlord is going to make think about making that decision. And you know what? I'm renting to the tenant, eh. and I, I see where they're coming from because they have maybe one store. Let's say you're a small landlord, you have one building, you have one store. So if you get a 10-year lease and you get a client in there and you screw the broker, I'm not saying it's ethical, but just from a pure Darwinian point of view, you're able to uh, rent that space out and you don't have to worry about finding a new tenant for 10 years. That broker is going to badmouth your building and your company to everybody in the business, but all, half of those people may be out. Being a broker seems like being a health insurance salesman back when I was an insurance salesperson. It seems like a fairly high turnover profession. It seems like a profession where the, the players in it, they, they're in there, they think they're going to make it big, and then they don't, and they work for three or four or five months and don't get a deal, well, you know, just bang their head against the desk the same way I do after getting you know, five or ten boards in a row missing PM Sleep S4L at 20, 40 milliamps boot looping and cycling with uh, hot T2 chips. And I just decide I'm, I'm done. I don't want to work on it. So I'm kind of thinking that 
the, the, the landlord is thinking, well, you know, by the time I got to lease this space out again, meh, everybody will forget what I did. That broker probably won't be in the business anymore. Or maybe he will be. I'll just find somebody else. And it's, you know, it's a scummy thing to do, but I get why they do it. They want to save money. And uh, I get why the brokers would prefer it seemingly. And, I, you know, Alan can make his own video on this if he'd like because I, I'm likely getting some things wrong as I'm tired and like to go home. Is that it seems like the brokers have an incentive to deal with the more the reputable and institutional landlords because they're the ones that have multiple properties. They're the ones that are going to need the services of the brokers again. They're the ones that are going to need need more clients to come in, and they're the ones that have the most to lose if they try to screw the broker. And I want to make sure that Alan has an incentive while looking for a space to not just skip over a deal because he thinks he's going to get fucked. So if it comes down to something where Alan finds the space for me that I go, drop, this is just drop dead beautiful, I love it, I want it, give me the lease, Let me, you know, give me the keys, that if the landlord tries to screw him or doesn't want to pay a broker, that I'll pay Alan the 15k or whatever um, that I find to be fair. Again, you know, in my mind, it's just a number that I'm set on something around first month's rent or a little bit more. But I, I, I can't pay what I can't pay what a commercial breaker would usually broker would usually get for an office or a, or a store because it's it's not first month. It's like first month and a l- it, it's quite a bit more. I, I don't remember the exact number. I just remember being on the phone with Alan and flying my little drone in my apartment, playing with it, and me crashing my drone after I heard the number that he gave me. So. <laughs> Erica's laughing because she remembers. Uh, that. So that's about that. If I feel like uh, continuing to film new spaces, I will. Now, one of the things that I said is perhaps I shouldn't film them while I'm going to the places with you. But Erica actually spoke out against that and said, you have to think about an institutional owner that's going to be offended if you show what their, what their electrical panel looks like or is offended if their super messages you like a jackass and you call them a cunt in a video. Because if one of my employees texted a client that way, even if they had been working here for two years, they're out the fucking door the next day. I don't care if they're suing me for wrongful termination. I don't care about any of that shit. There's a standard that I have at this business that I upheld, hold. And everybody here, even the people who are not friendly with clients, even people like Paul that were in the Marine Corps that just have no tolerance for bullshit understand that even when the most yuppie, uh, privileged kid shows up here on their mommy's dime, funded all on their mommy's dime, that's never had a hard day of work in their life, shows up and acts like an asshole, that you, there are times where you, you do what you're supposed to do and there are times where you can speak your mind, but there are times you got to bite your tongue and you need to know when those times are. Are. And if you just start mouthing off be, uh, and, and looking bad in front of real clients because they do one little thing that aggravates you when that wasn't really a, a terrible thing, you're gone. Because I don't get to do that either. You know, there are many times where somebody's acted like a complete asshole to me and I've gone off on them, but I make sure that you are acting like a complete asshole when I do that. I don't get to act like that. And I don't. You know, I I just, I can't apologize if other companies act like that. You know, nothing is going to change at that company. They're probably still going to send out the same form leases. That place, when it is looked at by another tenant, is probably going to have that same shit electrical panel that looks like, uh, honestly, that thing looks worse than my bike. I just, I don't know how else, I don't know what worse insult I can give than it looks less safe than the wiring on my buffang that I did at two in the morning at the store, but it's probably still going to be there. I don't think they're going to change the way they deal with clients. I don't think anything there is going to change. And honestly, I don't see the reason that I sh- I think Eric is right. I really don't see there being any reason that I should change this stuff. If you want to show your space with cockroaches battling it out and actually fighting with each other because you left a vat of nasty, disgusting food stuff, garbage liquid in there in some sort of pot in the basement that they're all climbing into and then dying and drowning in as they try to eat through it, so what if people see that? Uh, and, and Erica presented a fairly interesting argument there. Maybe I'll wind up filming the stuff. Maybe I won't. But for now, I would like to get back to the business of doing my job. And if a good space shows up, I'll take it. If a good space does not show up, then I will continue to make do with what I have. Because this has just been a fairly draining experience for me. Uh, that's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. And, um, yeah, I guess I'm not going to be going bankrupt. Sorry, Eli.